Good afternoon, guests, and welcome to the weekly with Dr. Tom. This is your way to stay up to date with everything healthcare related across the country. This week, we'll be joined by Lana Danielis, our favorite dietitian, and Peter King, and Dr. Peter Ling, who is the newest member of the BC Diabetes staff. We'll be doing a deep dive into carb counting and insulin adjustment. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. Submit your questions throughout by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Elliott will answer as many questions as possible live, but all will be answered by case managers in writing. Now, here's Dr. Tom. Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to the 14th, yes, the 14th edition of the weekly. That's just how long COVID's been running. Today started out for me a little differently. I awoke at 3.30 a.m., usually it's around 5.30 or 6, and I realized that I was part of a diabetes revolution and that there was no point trying to get back to sleep. My job, I decided, was to get up and to ensure that the diabetes revolution was quick and bloodless. The weekly is part of the revolution. You and the BC Diabetes team and Lana, our dietitian, and our past guest experts are engaging in online virtual diabetes group education sessions. There will be more of these, not just those provided by BC Diabetes, and perhaps not at 12 noon. Maybe we're going back to work sometime. Why? Because these sessions are efficient and cost effective. And dare I say, after 14 of them, somewhat enjoyable. Virtual individual care via phone calls and Zoom is part of the revolution as well. And it's here to stay and will endure long beyond COVID. But that viewers is not what woke me. I woke wondering how I was going to tell the world that the long awaited artificial pancreas, CGM integrated with insulin pumps, the technological cure for type one diabetes is now available and here today. And furthermore, how was I going to implement it? And most importantly, how were we going to get coverage for CGM, the only remaining obstacle preventing the 200,000 Canadians, including 20,000 British Columbians living with type one diabetes from adopting it. And of course, we, on, on uh, May 14th, we had an episode on this fantastic hybrid closed loop technology. Today, I'm going to do some revision on basal insulin adjustment and then hand over to dietitian Lana Danielis for her third guest appearance on the weekly. She'll be doing a revision on carb counting and rapid insulin adjustment, including lots of quizzes with Luke's help. And then she's going to introduce to us the concept of the glycemic index. Glycemic index incorporates the role of dietary fiber in carb counting and dietary fiber as you will recall from last week's Arthur's Corner, might just save our lives, not only loosen our bowels. But before anything else, I want to introduce to you Dr. Peter Ling, who will be doing a locum for me for the week starting July 6th, and who will then be working regularly as a part-timer at BC Diabetes starting in the fall. Dr. Ling is a specialist general internist with advanced training in diabetes here at BC Diabetes who brings welcome expertise in cardiology, hypertension, cholesterol, and acute medical care in general. He's on the staff at Richmond General Hospital in and out of emergency seeing patients there. He also has outpatient clinics in Richmond and Burnaby. Dr. Ling was born in Hong Kong and did his undergraduate and postgraduate medical education at UBC. He and his wife, Grace, have two little kids, aged three and six months. He's fluent in Cantonese and gets by, he says, in Mandarin, and I trust today he's going to be speaking English with us. <laughs> Peter's, a, Peter's a very welcome addition to BC Diabetes and a very timely one, I might add, because even revolutionaries need rest. I need a rest. Peter, please say hello to our viewers and welcome to BC Diabetes' staff and welcome to the weekly. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you everybody for inviting me. It is my pleasure to learn from everyone here. I have a lot to learn from you guys, so feel free to you know, help each other in the future. Thanks very much, Peter. I, I don't know. Uh, I think Peter is going to stay on a while. And, and if we have a question for him, it would be great to hear, Peter. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Well, uh, Lana uh, needs no further introduction, given that it's her third time here. Lana, please, uh, please help us. Actually, no, I think before I introduce you, I'm supposed to do something else. Yes. Um, I'm going to revise with you 
fixing the fasting sugar. And we, we're, we're assuming for now that you've done everything you can with diet and exercise. You're probably on some pills uh, from your family physician and your sugar's too high. The only thing left is to take basal insulin. Well, you remember from previous, uh, the previous episode that uh, the target for the fasting glucose, the sugar you wake up with, is between 5.0 and 7.0. If it's time for insulin, then we will have started you on basal insulin, probably insulin glygine U100, and we probably picked a dose just slightly higher than 0.1 units per kilo. For a typical 70 kilo man, we would usually start on 10 units. Next slide, please. And then we start the insulin, and as we gradually increase the dose, the sugar comes down. There are a couple of rules we have to obey. The first one is that if the sugar is less than five, that could get dangerously low. Therefore, whatever dose we took the day before of our insulin, we're now going to take four units less. The other rule is the one that we're going to invoke most frequently, and that is to increase the dose from the previous day by two units if we wake up and our sugar's more than seven. So the rule is, remember, if you're too high, you go up by two, and if you're too low, you go down by four. Now, on, on that slide, you can see that we, we later on use percentages. So the rule of thumb generally later, when you're getting really good at this, is that if the sugar's low, we reduce by 20%, particularly if you're symptomatic. And if it's high, we go up just by 10%. Next slide. So we're gonna fix the fasting sugar. Remember, if it's below five, we're gonna reduce by four. So the example is, let's say you took 20 units of Lantus or Basaglar yesterday, and today your sugar is 9.2. Um, that's above your target. So you should take two more. So you took 20 yesterday. You need two more because you're high. So your new dose is 22 units. What about the other, the, the other way? Let's say this time your sugar is too low. Um, you took 20, 20 units of insulin. Luke, can you move the slide? I've got something. Yeah. You took 20, of units, 20 units of Lantus yesterday. Your blood sugar this morning is below target. It's 4.3. 4.3 is actually a good sugar, but it's too good when you're just learning the ropes. So we, we want you above five. So your sugar's below target at 4.3. So now you have to reduce your dose of insulin by four. Yesterday you took 20. 20 minus four is 16. So 16 is the new dose of insulin going forward. Now, we've had a busy week at BC Diabetes and um, Lana, interestingly, called me about uh, uh, a client she'd seen whose sugars were running really low. And she said, Dr. Elliot, you know, I think this client of mine is doing everything right, but her sugar's too high. I think she needs insulin. So I phoned up the client and sure enough, after a discussion, uh, she agreed to take insulin and she agreed for us to look at the screenshots of her Freestyle Libre she has sent me the last four or five days. So we started her on 24 units of insulin and she sent me this picture the next day. And you can see that her sugar is well above target. It's averaging around 12. She was on 24 units of insulin. So based on the algorithm, up, there, up to down four, what should the new dose be? She took 24, what should she take? Most of you got it got it right, the new dose is 26. But if we can go back to the slide, of course, Dr. Elliot was guiding her and Dr. Elliot breaks his own rules. I actually asked her to go up by four units. So she went from 24 to 28. Luke, let's see what happened the next day. Well, the next day, the sugars were maybe a little bit lower, but still too high. So based on the fact that I asked her to increase by four the previous day, we asked her to go up by four the next day, so she went up to 32. Next slide. Okay, here, we, here we're starting to get somewhere, aren't we? She's woken up this morning with a sugar of around nine. So she took 32 the previous day. Her sugar's still above seven. What do you think we should do? I'm gonna tell you, I think we went to 36 units of insulin. Next dose, 
next day. Let's just assume this is this morning and uh, the, the client is working really hard. She's following a diet really, really closely. She's doing exercise that COVID allows. Her sugar's still too high. So not only did we increase her, her basal insulin a little bit, I think we went up by two units instead of four units. We stuck to Dr. Elliot's rule, but we also added some rapid insulin. And that is where I'm going to stop and hand over to Lana, our dietitian, because she's going to be talking about carb counting and rapid insulin. Uh-oh. Let's, let's just skip that slide, Luke. Lana, it's over to you. Yes, I uh, yes, it is. It is over to me. I'm just fascinated by that whole thing because that client uh, I haven't talked to yet. And so, wow. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, I'm glad to be back. And uh, this is one of my, getting to be one of my really super favorite subjects, um, carb counting, because I really, I actually don't want to talk about it uh, you know, in the far future, I want everybody to be a total expert at it. But uh, until we get uh, better at explaining it or, or simplify it for, for everyone, well, I guess it's not going to happen. And I'd appreciate feedback on what else everyone needs as a tool besides an app, which I'm surprised hasn't been developed yet. But, you know, these are the, the things that are in my head. We're looking at foods. And right now you can just look at, you know, things that you think would be lower or higher in carbohydrates. You know, and if your ratio was 10 to 1, you know, you'd be looking at brown rice and taking two units right now, but it's 23 carbs. But brown pasta uh, is roughly the same uh, cup size, half a cup, and it's uh, just a little bit more. So brown rice and brown pasta are the same. Um, sweet potato. You know, a medium potato, that's about two inches high and five inches long, that's uh, 24 carbs. So that's also not so bad. I mean, if you're looking at roughly the same thing, where it gets a little nutso is the medium serving of fries, 48 grams of carbs. That's, you know, not so good. If you really want to eat them, you can. Um, and then an apple, it's 24, um, an orange, is roughly the same size, a medium uh, orange, a little bit different weight, uh, and it has a little bit less carbs. And then blueberries, if I made it a cup, it would be 22 grams of carbs. So you see the, the, the carbs in there um, for foods, and that's just a single food. When you eat it in a meal like pasta with meat and a little bit of fat and a little bit of everything else, then it's going to be absorbed a little more slowly in your system. I mean, it's a food combination type thing. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're eating, you have to know how many carbs you're going to be eating. So unfortunately, a meal planning is a good thing uh, for you uh, to do your rapid insulin dosage when you're eating. And two hours after, after you eat, you need to test your blood sugar and see make sure that you're between the range of six to 10. Um, now, for people who are new to the rapid insulin world, a carb test meal is an excellent thing to do so that you get an idea of how much, it, what your ratio will be. So the ideal uh, a definition is a carb counting is the ideal dose of meal time rapid insulin uh, directly proportional to the carbs you're about to eat. Uh, you can figure out how many grams it takes to neutralize the effect of one unit of rapid insulin. And that's your carb ratio. That one I was talking about 10 to 1. There's 15 to 1. There's 5 to 1, 8 to 1. It's all different because everyone is different. So you usually do a carb test with just a simple carb like a bagel or toast. So here we'll take an example of a small, small bagel. Those are those mini bagels in the store. 30 grams of carbohydrate. And you're gonna assume that your carb ratio is 15 to one. Um, so if the carb has 30 grams and your ratio is 15 to one, you take your 30 carbohydrates divided by 15, which is your 15 to one ratio. And you get two, you get 30, 30 divided by 15 is two, which is two units of rapid insulin is what you need 
to neutralize the carbs in that bagel. And, and you test your blood sugar app. Oops. What do you, are you putting up a quiz? Yeah, we got, we got test meal uh, one quiz here, Lana. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so your glucose reading is 13 instead of, your glucose reading is 13 after this bagel. Uh, what would be a better carb ratio to try instead of 15 to one? Good. Well, did they answer both? Yep, and they were they were right on. Right on. So obviously, this this part is easy. I mean, Dr. Tom and I go back and forth on two easy questions or two hard questions, and I'll tell you that Dr. Tom does the easier questions. I'm I'm tougher. Um, two slices of white bread equal 30 grams of starch. So your carb ratio now is five to one. The same goal after post meal, six to 10 range. Your glucose reading is five to 5.5. 5. So what's a better carb ratio to try here? We'll wait for a couple more answers, maybe just 20 more seconds or 10 more seconds. All right, that looks good. Let's take a look. Hmm, a couple of very different answers here. Lana? Yes. Can you spend some time taking us through it? So, because yeah. some people. Not everybody's yeah. getting them right. So can, yeah. we, can we do a bit yeah. more revision, please? Yep. Okay. So your, your carb, you have 30 grams. Your carb ratio is five to one. Um, so technically you should be taking six, in, six units of insulin. However, um, at 5.5, you're going to hmm, round up, I believe. Uh, if I'm correct, and that is 5.5 is a little bit too low. It so is. I thought we were on the half range when we discussed this. Yeah. So their their dose was a little bit aggressive. Yes. Yeah. So you have to increase it. You have to increase. So, yeah. so you know, my my point is that that both the answers are kind of right. You know, we're on the we're on we're on the gray zone here. So yes. It's, the, the 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 rules are not. I mean, they're it's they're not, they're gray. Their, their guidelines. We 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 have to we have to use a little bit of give and take. Yeah. Let's 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 move on. Sorry, Lana. Okay. So I I did a few meals, you know, meals that we would take out or make if you're really good. Um, I did a, an assume a carb ratio of ten to one, and you. Know, are ordering three pieces of salmon nigiri, so you have the rice and the fish, and uh, dynamite roll has fish and rice and other stuff in the seaweed uh, wrap, uh, 35 carbs, and then a seaweed salad. So the total carb is 63, and your carb ratio is 10 to one. How many carbs would you need? Uh, not how many carbs, how many units of insulin would you need? Okay, I'll give five more seconds for the pull. And there we go. Yeah, the answer is six. We round down. If it's under five, so the 5.5 .5 was a tougher one that's uh, right in the middle. You could try higher and you could try lower and see what happens. Um, but the 63 is below 65, so you do the six units and if, if, Dr. Elliot, if, if Dr. Elliot can just butt in again you know for those of you who gave the extra unit it's not wrong it just it's we, we, we round down and for those of you who only gave a little bit of insulin that's not wrong either because 
what we want to avoid for sure is a low sugar. Yes. So if you're in doubt, give a lower dose and then check with Lana or me or one of the case managers. Thanks, Lana. Uh, chicken pad thai. For those of you who may not have eaten a chicken pad thai, it is rice noodles. There's a sauce with a little bit of sugar in it. There, it's not only sugar, there's soy and other, other delicious ingredients in there and lime and chicken and some tofu. Um, so it has 48, 46 carbs in it um, total. Uh, your carb ratio is 10 to one. What, oh, look at that. You guys are so speedy and you are correct. The answer is five. Again, 10 to, 10 to one carb ratio. And this time we're having chicken cor curry, a, a nice portion and a piece of naan bread. And I'm talking the whole piece of naan bread, 45 carbs. 53 carbs is your total. Uh, how many dose units of insulin do you require? Look good, they're coming in fast. And we'll end it there. Excellent, it's five. Now, it's because it's 53, 10 to one, you divide the 53 by 10, you get 5.3, you round down to five. Carb ratio, okay, vegan curry that you made at home with lentils, and you're gonna have some rice with it. It's a hefty 124 grams of carbs. Uh, there is protein in there, but your carb ratio is 10 to one, so it's how many, how many use insulin units do you need? Well, again, and they're answering quickly, so I'll end it now. Results. Pretty good, yes, 12, 13 if you're worried, <laughs> but 12 is the answer. And then homemade sheet pan blueberry pancakes, uh, a portion of that is 30 carbs. I added a tablespoon of 13 carbs, it comes to 43. How many units? They're, they're getting very good now. Mm. <laughs> Very good, it's four. Awesome. Uh, now, the reason I brought up in nutrition labels is that you know to read a nutrition label also requires some calculations. Um, you gotta look at your portion size on the top, the serving size is one cup. So if there's five cups in that package, you gotta do the math to get the one cup, don't eat the whole thing. And then um, you look at the total carbs, that circle underneath, and you um, have the dietary fiber, which in here, in this case, is zero. You, uh, you can look at the sugars if you'd like. It tells you how many sugar grams there are. And this is less than a teaspoon of sugar in this particular ingredient. Um, but the, the important part is the total carbs and the fiber. And um, it, it's like the total carbs is everything that will affect your sugar. The fiber, the sugars, starches, and sugar alcohols. So how to account for fiber? Uh, you can take it, you can do math like on the label there because they won't do it for you. It's total carbs minus the fiber equal your net carbs. And your rapid insulin Calculation is your net carb divided by your carb ratio. So now you've got, I've added the fiber, the true fiber into the uh, meal. Sushi has three grams, as you know, it's white rice. And the total is 62 carbs. So what would you be your insulin dose now? A little bit slower, so I'll give five more seconds. Remember that it's carbs minus fiber first, and then you divide by your carb ratio. I'll give, I'll give five more seconds from now. All right. Six is 
60 and uh, yeah, six is the answer. It's, it, is th it is 62 minus three is 59. 59 divided by 10 is 5.9. You round up six. That's the math. Okay, now we have our chicken pad tie. It has five grams of fiber. Remember it's carbs minus fiber divided by your carb ratio. Uh, much quicker now. Yep. Very good. Very good class. And now we have our curry. It's 53 grams, has four grams of fiber, same ratio of 10. The first 30 are coming in at lightning speed. There's some really smart clients out there. Okay, I'll end it now. Yes, excellent. And our vegan homemade curry, I told you there was fiber in here. 10, 10 grams of fiber from the 124. All right, and end there. Let's see how we did. Very good. I'm happy. And our sheep, our sheep, our blueberry pancakes, 45 carbs, eight grams of fiber. And if you want to know why there's so much fiber in there, it's because it's a gluten-free recipe made with almond flour. It's not white flour in here. I think they're getting really good at this, Lana. Um, so, I um, wanted me to talk about something. To lower your carb ratio. Yeah, I, 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 see, I see a lot of questions coming in from the audience about how do you decide on your carb ratio? I know oh, you start off with it. You start off with a test meal, right? And you yes, assume yes. your carb ratio is fifteen. Well, you assume it. Yes. Didn't we have a slide for that? Um, it depends on your sugar level after a post meal. Because it, it, it's based on your on your on your your post sugar levels because you're supposed to be between six and 10. And if it isn't. Yeah, Luke. But you, it's, your total, it's your total carbs in the day, I mean. Yeah. If, Lana, could I just have a-, a Yes, a you can. Um, so Lana's covered a lot of ground here today and it, it's, uh, you know, my take on it would be that we, we, we tell everybody a carb ratio of 15 to one because we don't want them to go low. And most people need more insulin than that. So you take yeah. a test meal, let's say you take a bagel of, yeah. of 30 grams, a small bagel, 15, it's 30 grams, 15 divided by two, uh, 30 divided by 15 is two, you take two units and it doesn't lower your sugar into the six to 10 right. range. So you need a bit more. So you could change your carb ratio, you could jump from 15 to 10, then then a bagel of 30 divided by 10 would be three units. Take three units, see what happens. Mm -hmm. So if your sugar was in the sweet spot with three units, then it means the carb ratio of 10 to one is good. If your sugar went low, if it went below 10, I'm sorry, if it went below six, then you took a bit too much and maybe you should have used a carb ratio. Instead of going all the way from 15 to 10, maybe you should have gone from 15 to 12. And then, and then I think in, in the first time we did carb, carb counting, I mentioned yeah, we did that. That, that a lot of people with type two diabetes need to take way more insulin. A lot of them need to take, have a carb ratio of 
of five to, five one, to one, two to one, or even one to one. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a lot of uh, testing, a lot of work. It is a lot of work, and you it, there is a lot of testing. It's no lie that this is not an easy easy thing for you to do. But it, once you do do your test meals and get it narrowed down then after that this type of calculation is going to be much easier for you but if you've never done a test meal for your carb ratio then for sure you're going to have trouble all the time uh my glycemic food index is uh a tool it, it's helpful it's not well explained i believe to most people who are diabetic um and we could do a better job as dietitians and anyone else that needs to explain it. Um, it's ra uh, rapid insulin is equal to the total carbs times the glycemic index divided by the carb ratio. We do, a, there's a lot of math involved in diabetes. <laughs> but the, the glycemic index is based on, uh, you took away my slide, Luke. <laughs> but, but, the, but anyway, uh, like it's based on glucose equals 100%. And that's the, uh, and then after that, sucrose is, I think, 50. And fructose is low, much lower. Fructose is in the fruits. So you have your foods, and you have your green light, yellow light, red light, meaning red light, don't eat, uh, eat as little as possible or in a one time. Medium is sometimes, and go for it is the green. And so you can see heavy mixed grain breads, spelt bread, sourdough whole grain tortilla these are the breads you can eat they have uh, a lower glycemic index meaning that it's not going to put a big not going to jump your insulin 10 feet high versus a white or a whole wheat bread and you know the, the thing about whole wheat is that it's not as good as everybody thinks it's whole grain bread that is the one that will keep your sugar in check whole wheat does not. Unfortunately, we process the hell out of that. Um, I can talk ad nauseum about food. Uh, the other thing is like the cereals or, and I'll skip grains because you know the grains themselves also have a lot of fiber in them. And that's why these particular uh, low glycemic indexes in the, in the uh, bread, cereals and grains are, are there. And then if you look at the apples, banana, banana green, I don't know how many people eat green bananas, but hey, um, cantaloupe, grapefruit, even a mango is a low glycemic, an orange. Now a mango, it can't be mushy sweet, like very squishy. It just has to be like a little bit soft on the outside skin to eat. Um, but it also has a lot of fiber in it. Uh, these type of fruits are great. Um, these are, these are the type of a guide, a tool to help you navigate when you're, let's say, having, I'm starving and I want to go grab something. <laughs> these are the kind of food, a uh, tool that can, you know, if you go with the green, you're not going to shoot yourself in the leg. Hey, thanks, Lana. Very informative as always. And Dr. Ling, I'm sure I speak for our entire audience when I say it's nice to meet you and that we're excited that you'll be working with us going forward. We're gonna to get to a couple of questions from the audience at this point. First one is for Dr. Ling. Dr. Ling, knowing that you are seeing patients in the emergency room at Richmond Hospital, have you noticed any change in the number of people coming in with diabetes related problems during COVID? Yeah, de definitely. So we, I've seen a few, you know, uh, more urgent scenario where people miss the insulin, and they, like these are people who have been on insulin, and then uh, they, they run off insulin, and they have they run into things like a high hyperglycemic emergency, like what we call DKA. So we have a few cases like that, uh, but but you know, it's not often. Uh, most people are able to get um, the medications from their uh, physician. I mean, that's the, the, that's the importance of telemedicine right, uh, these days. Um, you know, we, we used to go to see our doctors to grab our medicine. But right now, what, what many doctors have been doing is, you know, use the phone and then speak to um, the doctor and the pharmacist. 
So very important message here is that if we use, uh, like for those people who are on uh, diabetes medication, and if you run out, don't be shy to talk to your physician to get, to get the supply, because uh, this is important to, to continue the medications. Thank you. Yeah, I know a lot of people have been concerned about what to do, so that's, that's some good clarification. The next question is from Peter, and it's Talana. Are all carbs equal? I find treating some same carb count of pasta versus potato versus long grain rice. I will go after potato and rice, but pasta, I will be fine. Any reason? Could you speak to it? Is there a difference? Mm, there should not be a difference in, in it unless it's like pasta, you'd be probably fine. Maybe you're cooking it al dente and al dente is the proper way to cook pasta. Uh, because it's um, if you cook it over, it's it's a cooking process, and a, a potato well well cooked or mashed ma mashed is going to have a slightly higher starchy content than not. A potato salad that's cold is going to have a resistant starch in it and not up your sugar as much. I mean, as I said, foods are foods are my thing, but I can give you reasons for particular foods. Um, I don't know what kind of rice you're talking about. If it's brown or, right, or white, uh, white should boost your, your sugar is pretty high. Brown is uh, somewhat better. But uh, the pasta itself, if it's cooked a lot and it's mushy, it will, it, will sh it will shoot your insulin up more than if it's cooked al dente. That's the science behind cooking. Thanks, Lana. Now at this point, we're gonna to go to Dr. Weisinger for Arthur's Corner. Arthur is our staff scientist and we'll be discussing diabetic retinopathy and mice. Arthur, please. Thank you very much, Tristan. Today I would like to talk about a new treatment that could help to prevent vision loss and diabetes. Mm -hmm. Slide, please. Diabetic retinopathy is a common complication of diabetes and continues to be a leading cause of blindness. Currently, there aren't many treatments available that can control the progression of retinal complications in patients with diabetes, and none that will stop it in its earliest stages. Clearly, a treatment is needed. Slide, please. We know that the pigment in retinas, which is crucial to vision, is lost early in diabetic retinopathy. The chromophore, the molecule 9-cis retinal, is a chemical related to vitamin A that can form visual pigments in cells of the retina and could be used for an early treatment. A nice idea, but how do you test it? Slide, please. You use mice, of course. There's a strain of mice called Akita that has a genetic mutation that causes type 1 diabetes. These mice undergo retinopathy just like humans. In the current study, Akita mice were injected with a chromophore to determine if it would halt progression of the retinal degeneration. Slide, please. When diabetic mice were given a single injection of 9-cis retinal in the body cavity, they developed increased visual pigment. Further, cell loss in the retinas was reduced and vision was restored. Thanks, Luke. These results are very new and haven't been tested in humans yet, but it's very likely that this treatment with a visual chromophore could help to prevent early vision loss in patients with diabetes. Until that treatment is ready, careful control of blood sugar is your best defense against diabetes-related vision loss. Thank you. I'll see you again next week. Thanks, Arthur. We're going to get back to a couple more questions here. The first one is from Sean. Dr. Elliot, why did you break your own rule and go up by four units with that new client? <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Um, you guys sure keep me honest. Well, the, she was on a bigger dose than, than usual for starting because she has, she's a, has a heavier frame. So we started her on more than twice the usual amount of insulin. So you remember I told, about we, I told you that we, instead of going up by two and down by four, we sometimes go up by 10% and down by 20%. So I used the 10% rule. So she was on, I think she was on 28 or something and 10% of 28 is 2.8, and I rounded it up to four. Wow. So, so there is a bit of discretion, um, and the higher the dose, the 
it, it is quite safe to go up by 10%. But I agree, I did break my own rules. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Ling. It's from Tanya. What role does sleep deprivation play in high blood sugar mm. and weight loss? Very, very good question. Um, so, so, uh, so I think I think the question is what happened. Like, so, what is the uh, what is the effect of sleep sleep quality uh, in terms of uh, blood pressure, right? So, there is one medical condition uh, by the name of sleep apnea. So, in people with uh, you know some sleeping. Uh, uh, you know, some poor sleeping quality related to uh, sleep apnea, for example, the body is constantly uh, in a, uh, you know, exciting state, right, uh, when they are sleeping because they don't sleep well. So constantly, um, the body may wake up and the patient does not know about it. So when you don't have a deep down of your blood pressure during sleep, then people start to have hypertension, okay? So that's why you see people with sleep apnea, the problem is not only about the sleep quality, but it also affects even organ system. For example, cardiovascular system. People have higher risk of stroke or hypertension or heart related problem like atrial fibrillation if they have a sleep apnea or sleep up issues. So, so definitely, definitely remember, right? Uh, we are created, uh, sleep is, to, is created for us to relax at, the, uh, at night, right? If there is no dipping of our blood pressure when we are sleeping, it will have a negative impact on our cardiovascular system and result in hypertension. So I'm not sure if that answers the questions. I think that's very good. Thank you, Dr. Ling. The next question is from Maureen, and it's to Dr. Elliott. Have you heard of Sierracil? It's a joint formula, by the way. And is it okay for diabetics? Uh Maureen, I haven't heard of it. I'm just Googling it. Sierra Sulfur Joints, here we go. Well, it's, it's heavily advertised, so I'm sure somebody's making money out of it. Um, I suspect it doesn't do much good. It probably doesn't do any harm, but I will research it and give you a better answer later. Is that the Maureen I know from dance? No comment. The, oh. the questions are anonymous. Okay. The next question is from Art and it's to Lana. Why are French fries double the carb count over potato when they both weigh the same at 120 grams? Lana, you're muted. And fortunately, I do not have the real answer for that. I mean, I just, I, I know, oh, Dr. Tom knows, he knows yeah. everything. Can, but can, I, let, let me just butt in. I think, you know, I think that that slide you showed us on the glycemic index is very helpful. Yes. So is, is there some, is, is something happening to the fries? Are they different fries? Uh, are they different potatoes they use for fries? So that potatoes, Fried potatoes have got a, a higher glycemic index, less fiber. Is that possible? You know what? I, I'm going to look into this because I, you know, I, I realize it's the same potato. I know that it's worse for you because it's fried. So I'm trying to figure out if frying has something to do and mutated the starch further. Like this is my thought process, but I don't have a scientific answer for you right now, but I can give it to Luke to send to everybody, and then that would be my solution to this. Good question. Thank you very much, Lana. At this point, I'm gonna ask Luke to put a slide up. BC Diabetes has launched a petition for the BC government to get continuous glucose monitoring, also known as CGM, covered by Pharmacare. We think that CGM is a revolutionary technology that all type one diabetics should have covered. You can help us by going to change.org forward slash BC diabetes. Again, we'd love it if you signed our petition at change.org slash BC diabetes. Now, Dr. Elliott, do you wanna to touch on this petition at all and, and let people know how you feel? Well, well thanks Tristan. It's um. You know, I think about a lot of things, but what woke me up at 3.30 in the morning is, the, is this revolution and CGM 
I guess, was the start of the revolution um, seven or eight years ago. And now the only thing stopping uh, the artificial pancreas from being available to every ordinary British Columbian and Canadian is, is coverage for CGM. So it's absolutely <laughs> essential for type 1 diabetes. And of course, it's, it makes an amazing difference in type 2 diabetes. So this, this petition is front and center. We're, you know, I always talk to Dr. D Mr. Dix, the Minister of Health, assuming he's on the show. Uh, he's never responded to acknowledge he is. But, uh, you know, the, of, of the many things he can do to make life better for people living with diabetes, covering CGM is, is absolutely on the top. Tristan, um, I know that we're going to send this out to all the viewers, but viewers, if you would send it to all your friends and acquaintances and Facebook, con Facebook contacts, that's how we're going to get tens of thousands. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. We got, a, we got time for a few more questions. We're gonna to go to Samuel here. And it's to Dr. Elliott. If I am only on four units of basal insulin and my fasting falls below five the next day, can I stop taking it altogether? Great question, Sam. If you follow the rules, that's what it says. Yep. You go down by four. So yes, you can go straight down to four. And if you want to be less conservative, you could, you could go down to two. But, uh, you know, depending on your body build and, and, and your level of physical fitness, et cetera, um, you definitely need less. And, and I would recommend stopping it. And then if your sugar is too high, you can go up by two. So that would take you back to two units, wouldn't it? Thank you, Dr. Elliott. The next question is for Lana. Is the increase by 20% and reduce by 10% a hard and fast rule? Are there exceptions? As you saw from Dr. Elliot, uh, I think that's a doctor's decision. <laughs> I'm, I would pass this to Dr. Elliot and not me. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, it, it is not a hard and fast rule, but it's 20%, a 20% drop um, is, is a good standard drop. If you've had a severe low, a severe low is where you pass out or you need someone to help you then you need a bigger than a 20% reduction. So we always want to avoid low sugar. So 20% is a minimum. Um, and then in terms of going up, we, we know that it's not a hard rule. We can go up by a bit more than that. But we always want you to err on the, on, on the side of safety. Thank you, Dr. Elliot. Now, Lana, for someone who wanted to cut carbs entirely out of their diet, we've had a couple questions. Could you give a great example of a carbless meal that someone could have maybe two or three times a week and be happy with? A carbless meal and zero carbs? Um, just, you, uh, you need some carbs because you need some fiber. Um, I am a fiberaholic and your system won't run very well without some fiber in it because what goes in must come out, if I can say that. Um, so I would say that if you want a very low carb, a, a cup of spinach is one carb. Actually, it's zero because it's one carb and one carb and one gram of fiber. So it's actually zero carbs. So there's an answer for you. So if you had two cups of spinach, it would be zero. And you can have a two cups of spinach salad and Lana will be happy because you at least had two carbs out of your 25 required if you're female uh, in your mid-range mid age and 38 if you're male. And um, then you can add protein, chicken, beef, whatever you want. Um, if you're vegetarian, that's where you're going to have your trouble unless you like tofu a lot. And, uh, and there you go. As a, as a meal or ka uh, not kale, but um, romaine or, but spinach and the sp spinach is the best one I can think of right at the moment. Kale is a little bit higher in, in carbs, but not to cry over. And um, that's what I can give you right now. Thanks so much, Lana. The next question is from Michael and it's to Dr. Ling. Dr. Ling, are diabetics more prone to cardiac arrest? Mm. 
very good question. Um, so remember, diabetes can affect our blood vessels. It can affect the heart, multiple organs. So the reason why people have, you know, for example, heart attack, many times they have, you know, underlying uh, what, what we call coronary artery disease. So these are a plaque, uh, you know, um, cholesterol build up uh, in your vessels. So if you imagine uh, diabetes, people have more damage in the blood vessels in everywhere, anywhere in your body, including the heart. So it won't be surprising that people who have diabetes are more at risk of heart problem and therefore maybe more uh, chance of having heart attack. I think that's, that's the logic. So very careful, we have to, like, we always have to prevent the end organ damage from diabetes. And if, if Peter, if I can add, we, this is our 14th, the weekly, we've had, we've had a couple of sessions on risk reduction. Uh, we've talked about cholesterol and blood pressure and sugar. We even talked about chelation therapy. So for those of you listeners out there who have diabetes, yes, statistically, the risk of a cardiac arrest is higher, but you can reduce that risk very close to the non-diabetic range by getting everything right. Good sugar, good blood pressure, good cholesterol, be on one of those statin drugs. Um, maybe do the chelation study, maybe do one of our other research studies. So it's, uh, there's, there's, there's a great deal of hope. Thank you, Dr. Ling and Dr. Elliot. We have time for one last question. It's from David and it's to Dr. Elliot. How do you know if you need to implement rapid insulin into your plan? Thanks, David. So, um, Let's say that you're doing everything right. You're, you're exercising, you're following a prudent diet. You might even be on a really low spinach and chicken diet. Um, you've, you've got yourself on basal insulin. And when you wake up in the morning, your sugar's between five and seven. That You're doing everything right. But after you eat, your sugar goes high. That means that your body's unable to produce enough insulin to control it. And that's where this whole subject today, what it's all about. So let's just say, uh, you know, you're going to do one of those meals that Lana laid out. By the way, Luke, are we going to get a copy of those, of that meal, of those meals for viewers? Definitely. Okay. Those viewers, that's going to be on uh, bcdiabetes.ca slash handouts with Lana's name on it. So you can search on that. But so let's say, um, let's say it's, it, it's breakfast and you're going to have um, some steel cut porridge, which has got, it's, it's got lots of fiber, but it does have carbs. And you're gonna have a bowl. I think that's about, let's say it's 40 grams. Um, a good place to start would be assuming a carb ratio of 15. So 40 divided by 15 is around about three. So you can round up or round down, but you need to start on some insulin. And then when you have breakfast the next day, you can see, you can make a decision as to whether you took enough. So that's, that's where the carb counting comes in. Um, you know, Lana talked about glycemic index. That's why, uh, you know, steel cut oats are gonna raise your sugar less than, than instant oats. Mm. Um, by the way, these, all of these um, weeklies uh, are available on our YouTube channel, which is bcdiabetes.ca slash YT. And they're, they're posted six days after the event. So you can see this one in six days and you can go back and look at the previous one as well. So rapid insulin is for meals if your sugars go too high. Thanks, Dr. Elliot. The Q&A sessions never disappoint. At this point, we'd like to throw it back to Dr. Tom for his outro. Dr. Tom. Thank you, Tristan. Um, Thank you, Peter, for joining us and introducing yourself to, to, the, to uh, our, our viewers. Lana, thank you again uh, for your guidance. You sure made it difficult for us today and we're all gonna have to think about dietary fiber uh, a whole lot more. Um, next week, we welcome UBC kidney specialist, Dr. Nadia Zalanado, who will speak to diabetes and kidney health and answer our questions. The following week, I'll be on holiday, but I'll still host. And we will focus on diabetes research with our BC Diabetes staffers, Dr. Marla Indusil, who's the Director of Clinical Trials, and Karen Fung, who's in charge of Human Research Protection. They're gonna take us through 
the ins and outs of research. We apologize for not being able to answer all questions live. Any un unanswered questions we'll provide written answers to via email. Uh, it's been great to see you again, viewers, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good week, stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Now a quick reminder about our petition, which you can find at change.org slash BC Diabetes. Now I'm happy to report that we've had 11 people sign since we announced it on this webinar. We'd also like to remind you, as Dr. Elliott said, about our YouTube channel. You can find that at bcdiabetes.ca slash YouTube. And at this point, we'd like to say a special thank you to our partners and to Lana and Dr. Ling and to our beloved audience, you. If you want, have a lovely weekend. We'll see you next Thursday.